4. We're going to be looking at two verses. Verse 9 and 10. 1 John chapter 4, verse 9 and 10. It says, In this the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much for this day, for this time that we have together to worship you as the people of God, as the body of Christ. Thank you so much for this season of Christmas where we are reminded, God, of your grace and your goodness toward us. Lord, today, I pray as we look at your word together, as we are here to celebrate and commemorate Christmas May our thoughts and our minds, may we go back to that place in Israel 2,000 years ago where you stepped into time. May we remember the great purpose for why you came. And God, today, anoint us. Open up our hearts. Open up our lives today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. This morning I want to preach to you on true love on display, true love on display. We are at the, we're right at the finish line to wrap up Christmas, aren't we? We're right there. For some of you, you you began uh, really on October 31st. I know some of you, I know there's, there's a very popular radio station in our area that on November 1st starts playing Christmas music, and I typically don't listen to that radio station until December because I know that if I turn it on in November, I'm going to hear Christmas music. And this time of year is an awesome time. It's a time where we remember some of the past Christmases that we experienced, and we remember some of the gifts that we got. Now, I'm 39 years old, and I remember a particular Christmas that I had that stands out to me was in the early 90s. And I would not say, I don't want to say that we were poor, because I don't think we were poor. We might have been, but I didn't know it. We're not. My mom's shaking her head. We weren't poor. But, <laughs> but I also know that we definitely weren't the rich kids. I know that for a fact. And there was one particular Christmas in the early 90s, and this will tell you how old I am, where I got a Sega Genesis and my brother got a Super Nintendo. Now, if you're, you know, that was a big deal. If you're, if you're right around my age, you know, that was a big deal. That was a big Christmas. And I, and I know that they did that because my mom, one of her love languages is she likes to spend money on people. That's how she shows her love. So I know that she did that because she loves us. That was the motivation. She wanted to see us happy on Christmas. She wanted to see us, our eyes light up, and I know they don't have video of it, but if they did, we'd probably act like crazy people when we open those up. But you see, it was motivated by love. There was something that motivated that gift. There was a love behind that. And this morning as we come to remember Christmas, as we come to remember this time, I want us to be reminded of the genuine love that God showed us. I want us to be reminded of the great love of God and the great extent that God went once and for all to show us beyond all lies of the enemy, beyond whatever opinion you may have this morning, the extent that God went to show you once and for all that he loves you, that he cares for you, that he loves this world. Let's be reminded of of it this morning. In 1 John chapter 4, as we look at these verses, we read in 7 and 8 that the Apostle John returns back to this theme of love. In fact, if you read his his epistles, it's one of the themes that you see. He'll use that phrase, love, again and again. And he returns back to it in verse 7, and he says this, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. 
He tells us as God's people to love one another for love is of God. And then he goes on to say that those who, are, those who love are born of God and know God. And that is to say this, that if someone is born again, if someone has the Holy Spirit living on the inside of them, it is inevitable that they will love the people of God. And if they do not love one another, it is inevitable or evidence that they have not been born of God and that they do not know God. And then he says in verse 8, he says, He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. God is love. Love is not something that God has. Love is not something that God often shows here and there. God is love. There is no love apart from God. God is the source of love because love finds its source in God. The God that we serve, the God of the Bible, the God of creation, the God of this world, the God that sent his son into this world, the God who is God, a very God, is love. Amen. Amen. We see this morning that it's his very nature... And that there is no genuine love apart from God. And as we are here to celebrate Christmas, let's be reminded and truly consider this true love on display. Let's be reminded this morning. Look at what verse 9 says. And there's some things I want to draw out of these texts. It says this in verse 9. In this the love of God was manifested toward us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world. Here's the first thing that we see. We see true love's person. True love's person. God's word tells us in this the love of God was manifested. In this the love of God was demonstrated. This is how it was made known. This is truly how you know that God is love and that he truly and deeply loves you. Here's how you know that God loves you. He sent his only begotten son into this world. This is how you know that God loves you. Jesus is love in flesh. Amen. Jesus is the embodiment of love. If you want to know what love is, look at Jesus. Look at him. Look at his life. Look at what he did. That's how you know that God loves you. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us that God sent his son. What does John 3, 16 say? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God loved the world so much that he sent his son into this dark and sin-cursed and broken world. Jesus was sent as a clear and manifest proof of the love of God and his grace toward you and I. Jesus came. He is the true love's person. He is the reason that we celebrate. He is the one that the prophets wrote about. He is the one that we sang about just a minute ago, just as the prophet Isaiah foretold 700 years before it took place. In Isaiah 7 and verse 14, it says this, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And that literally means God is with us. In Isaiah 9 and verse 6 it says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Jesus is the son that was given. Jesus is the one that was sent. He is true love's person. And Jesus, because of God's love, was manifested and sent forth into this world because God loves you and I. Galatians 4 and verse 4. But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons. He was sent for you and I. He was sent as manifest proof that God loves you. But here we see 
he goes on to say in verse 9, he says that in this the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world, that we might live through him. Here's number two, true love's purpose, that we might live through him. God sent his son that we might live, that we might have life. This is the great purpose for why he came. Not just any life, but eternal life. God sent his son and came into this world that you and I might live and have life and eternal life. And you may be sitting here this morning and I would say, you would say, what are you talking about? I'm living, I'm alive. There's breath coming into my lungs right now. Right? You're here, you're thinking thoughts. Right? You're here. You would say, I'm alive. What in the world are you talking about? God's word makes it clear, and this is utterly important for you and I to understand Christmas. That the word of God says in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1, that we are dead in sins and dead in trespasses. That you are dead while you live. That is, you are separated from God. You don't have a relationship with God. In your own natural self, born into this world, you are a sinner. And because of sin, you stand separated from God. Right now, that is the condition of everyone born into this world. You are dead in sin. You realize this morning you are wrapped in grave clothes even as you sit here if you do not know Jesus. If you are not in a saving relationship with Jesus, that even as you sit here this morning, you are dead. You're dead in sin. You're dead in trespasses. We are born dead in sin. And there's only one way that you can come out of this death. Jesus said in John 14 and verse 6, I am the resurrection, or I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There's only one way out of this death. There's only one way out of this tomb. There's only one way that you can go from being dead in sin and alive again and have eternal life. And it's through Jesus. There is no other way to be saved. There is no other way to have life. There is no other way to experience this. He is the Savior of the world. Jesus said in John chapter 10 and verse 10, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. Jesus standing outside of the tomb of Lazarus or near the grave of Lazarus said to the sisters there, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will never die. He is the only one that can give life. You see, the Word of God makes it clear that the wages of sin is death. That's the penalty. That's the, what you have earned. That's what you deserve. That's what we deserve. The wages of sin is death. That's the debt that you owe. Ezekiel chapter 18 the prophet Ezekiel said, Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. The soul who sins shall die. Christ came that you and I might live through him. That we might experience life, life everlasting. We are, as I've said, dead in sin, dead in trespasses. Paul says that we are alienated from the life of God. And he's not speaking just of a special class of really bad sinner. He's speaking of everybody. Everybody. We all at one time conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, pursuing the desires of the flesh, and were by nature children of wrath. That's you and I. 
But then he says in verse 4, But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even while we were dead in sins, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ, that in the ages to come we might show the exceeding greatness of his love and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. That is, throughout all of eternity, when we are around the throne, we will declare and show forth the mercy and the grace and the kindness of God for all of eternity that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us. For by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Praise God. Here you see true love's purpose. That he came that you and I might have life. How can a dead man raise himself back up? He can't. How can you, how can you and I, who are sinful by nature, make our hearts clean and make it new? We can't, but he can. How can we take that heart of stone that's dead and give us a new heart? We can't, but he can. And that was why he came. That's why he was born in a manger. That's why he took on flesh. That's why we sing the songs. That's why we celebrate each year. I don't know what the world is celebrating when they sing jingle bells and rocking around the Christmas tree. But I know what I'm celebrating. I'm celebrating that the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And then we see verse 10, he says, In this the love of God, verse 9, was manifested toward us that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. Verse 10, in this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sin. Here you see, lastly, true love's price. True love's price. In this is love, not that we loved God. It wasn't our love for him that in turn made him love us. No. It wasn't him looking at something in us and then deciding that we were somehow worthy of his love. No, 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 no. It says in verse 19, we loved him. Why? Because he first loved us. In this is love, not that we loved God, we don't even seek after God. Right? Paul the Apostle said in Romans chapter 3 that there are none who seek after God. No, not one. You don't even seek Him. You seek after all the stuff He can give you. I know that. You seek peace. You seek belonging. You seek fulfillment. You seek after all the things that he can give you, but you don't truly seek after him. But if you are here this morning and there's something on the inside of you rising up to go after God, I want you to realize that that is there because he first sought you. Amen. He sought you. He didn't leave you alone. Praise God, he didn't leave you alone. Praise God, he didn't leave us to ourselves. But he came to us. He drew us. The Holy Spirit moved in us. And this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us. He loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sin. That's a $50 word right there, isn't it? That's a big word. That's a big word, isn't it? 
You know, the translators, even of the newer translations, left that word alone in many translations because of the significance of that word. Propitiation. Christ came to be the propitiation. That is, he came to be the atoning sacrifice. That's why he became a baby. He did not come a ba- become a baby so we could be all sentimental once a year. That's not why. It's okay to be sentimental, right? It's okay to have those feelings, but that's not why he came. He came and he wrapped himself in flesh and became truly man. He became truly man for the purpose of death. Hebrews 2 and verse 9 says that he was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for every man. He was made man so he could die, and not for his own sin, not for any wrong that he had done, but he became man in order to die for my sin and for your sin. He became man and he went to the cross, not, listen, not to make God love us. That's that's the pagan definition of propitiation. That's not the Christian definition of propitiation. The pagan definition is that there's an angry God and you can only make him happy by making a sacrifice. And that's not what the word of God displays to us. The word of God tells us plainly, God loved us. That's why he sent his son. He loved you. He loved you. That's why he's not, he wasn't up there uh, waiting to love you, but he loved you so much that he sent his son to go to a cross and on the cross, my iniquity. You got to feel this. This is the old story. This is the heart and soul of the Bible. You take this out and none of this even matters. You take what I'm about to say away and there's no, there's no point to even coming to church. Jesus on the cross took sin. My sin. All oh, the mountain of guilt that was on my back and your back. It was laid on him. He took the cup and drank it in your place. He was the sacrifice in your place. And now God can look on him and look at his sacrifice and then look at you when you place faith in him and say, clean, innocent, forgiven, justified. That's what he did on the cross. That's why that baby came. Amen. He came that we might be saved. Period. That's why we celebrate Christmas. He came. He was manifested. His only begotten son was sent that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Now listen to me. It's Christmas Eve. You're in a church in Cincinnati, Ohio. It's 2023. Sixty years from now, seventy years from now, eighty years from now, ninety. None of us, hundred years, are going to be alive. You're not going to be alive. And you're here in 2023 on a Christmas Eve service. And you've just heard 
why we celebrate Christmas. And I want to say to you, none of that will matter if you do not believe in Jesus. There is no other way for you to be saved. You will not save yourself. No one else, nothing else will save you. Why do people reject this love? Why? Don't reject God's love for you. If you come to him, the word of God says, he will receive you. There's never been anybody that ever came to Jesus that ever came with believing faith and wanting to put their trust in him and Jesus said no. It's never happened before. And it doesn't matter what you've done, the lifestyle you've lived, it doesn't matter. If you come to Jesus, he will receive you and change you and transform you. That's why we celebrate Christmas. Amen. Amen. Let's bow our heads together. Lord, thank you so much. Thank you that you loved us so much that you sent your only begotten Son that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Thank you, Jesus for being true love on display. Thank you, Lord. Let's stand together right now. Let's stand all over this place. I praise you, God. If you're here today and you've never received Jesus or you want to come back to the Lord, pray to him right where you're at. Talk to him. Talk to him. Talk to him. Ask him to save you. Ask him to forgive you. Ask him to change you. Ask him to do his work in your life. Receive him right now. Don't wait. Pray to him. Pray to him right now. God's word says that today, today is the day of salvation. Now is the acceptable time. Place your faith in him right now. Do you see Jesus? Do you see him? Do you see what he did for you? Do you see? Is the Holy Spirit speaking to you? Place your faith in him right now. Don't wait. If you right now want to come and pray at this altar, this altar is open for prayer. If you want to pray at your seat, pray at your seat. But talk to the Lord right now as we sing a song. Praise you.
come they're going to pass out communion guys can go ahead and pass that out. are a little different, so you want to open up the bread part first. Go ahead. You can do that now to get ready. Huh. 
Technology is wonderful. Is there anybody that has not been served that would like to be served? First Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's partake of the bread, remembering the body of Christ. Let's partake together. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's partake of the cup, remembering the precious blood of the new covenant. Let's worship him this morning. Praise you, Jesus. Let's worship him this morning. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us. God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. 
And this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Thank you, Lord. Let's lift our hands today. Lord, thank you so much that you sent your son. Thank you so much. Thank you, God, for your word. Thank you, God, for your blood and the price that was paid for our sin. Thank you, God. God, help us to live in light of this reality moment by moment, day by day. And Christ came into the world to save sinners. Lord, we thank you and we praise you and we worship you. Lord, go with your people. Bless them this Christmas. Be with their families. Jesus, may you be glorified. God, I just pray for the best Christmas that every family has ever had, God, this year. Go with your people. In Jesus' name. I'm going to ask if our ushers, if they would, stand back there at the door. And today, if you want to give, you can give as you're leaving. Or but you all Thank you so day. much for joining us this morning in our time of worship and the Word. And I would encourage you, if you need anything, if you need prayer or whatever you may need, we are here for you. And I want to personally encourage you to reach out to us with any prayer requests or, or questions that you may have about the Lord. Thank you and have a blessed day.